Welcome to the American Prepping Academy. My name is JJ Johnson and today we're going to be talking about primary disaster preparedness concepts. So this lesson is going to be for the freshmen, uh, the, the folks who are new into prepping who are just looking to get a good understanding of some of the basic concepts that we talk about routinely in the preparedness community. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about mindset. We're going to talk about situational awareness, some everyday carry gear, nine essentials, oh, excuse me, the nine essential needs of any disaster situation, redundancy and planning, your area of responsibility or AOR, team plans, shelter in place location or bugging in. We're also going to look at your home defense plan, bug out vehicle, and secondary shelter in place location or your bug out. Now like I said these are general concepts we'll be getting more into each one of these on Patreon and where we will actually dig in uh, pretty specifically and pretty thoroughly on pretty much each of the concepts that you see here in this video. Okay with mindset uh, there are basically three types of people in this world and those are sheep wolves and sheepdogs. Preppers, we see ourselves as the sheepdogs. We're the guardians of the pack. Uh, as such, we try to do as much as we can to be prepared for emergencies, and uh, we're the folks who are ready to step up in the face of adversity. Prepping is all about being able to take care of your family, not only in the best of times, but also in the worst of times. If you're properly prepared, many emergencies are little more than an inconvenience. If you're not prepared, they can be catastrophic. All right, with situ situational awareness. This is being alert to what's happening around you. Today's day and age, many people just walk around with their head down on their cell phone. As preppers, we try to avoid that and we try to be vigilant and keep an eye on things that are going on around us. Uh, I like to break this down into three stages of vigilance. Uh, we have the green stage which is uh, the stage when you're comfortable, you have looked around you, you've established your baseline, and uh, you believe that you're in a fairly safe place. You're staying alert, but you, you, know, you, you feel comfortable. Yellow is the stage where we're in transitions. This is the, the point when we're moving from point A to point B, and uh, this is a heightened state of awareness where we are you know, on the lookout for things that could be a problem for us and the red stage is the final stage and that is a stage where you have identified some sort of threat and now you are taking some kind of action to to avoid that threat or deal with that threat directly uh, this is basically a, a shortened version of the Cooper's uh, color codes and I think it's a little bit easier to follow and easier to remember. All right, now entering establishments. Uh, this is a, a, when you're in the yellow phase, when you're transitioning from your vehicle to your, you know, to a restaurant or something along those lines. And what you want to do is you want to take a peek when you first get into the establishment, and this is going to help you to establish your baseline. Now, a peek is an acronym that stands for patrons. That's the people in, you know, the customers in the restaurant that we're talking about and looking around, taking a look at them and saying, hey, are, is everybody comfortable? Does everybody look like, you know, they're, they're behaving in a way that seems normal? Then you want to look at the employees. That's the next E, employees. Does the staff look like they're stressed out or do they look like they're going about their business as usual? Then you want to look for exits. That's this, the next E in this acronym. And the exits are, uh, you want to know about them so that if you need to make a quick exit, you can. If somebody comes in uh, shooting the place up or something along those lines, you know, you can get your children out that door or whatever, you know, a little quicker. Um, so that's what the E is for. The next one is cover. Um, if you are a person who carries a concealed firearm and you... Um, may need to return fire if an active shooter came into the establishment then you'd want to know where the nearest cover is because it's always better to shoot from cover if possible and then the last one is killers and this is a two-part meaning you're gonna look for those people who could be the potential bad guys you know the killers or you also want to look for those guys who could be in a position to assist you 
the guys who may have a similar mindset to you. So that is taking a peek at a real quick, just a real quick overview there. Okay, now we also want to try to apply gray man principles. Now, a gray man uh, principle is basically just trying to do the best that you can to blend in in such a way that will allow you to accomplish whatever task it is that you're doing at the time. And uh, for this instance, we're, we're applying gray man to mean that you just want to blend in. You don't want to, as you're doing these things that we're talking about, you don't want to stand out. So you want to try to do them in such a way that uh, it helps you to blend in as much as possible. Okay, so the next thing here is, is obviously if you are um, a concealed carrier, and uh, I hope that you are, you need to make sure that you know your state self-defense laws. This is really important uh, because it, you, know, you need to know is your state a stand your ground state or a duty to retreat state. This has major uh, legal consequences if you end up getting in a self-defense shooting. Does your state have castle doctrine? And if so, does that extend outside the home? These are good things to know. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at everyday carry gear, or some people call it your EDC gear. And these are things that you just want to keep with you um, as much of the time as possible. Uh, because it's going to allow you to deal with just a lot of common issues, um, self-defense issues, and, and you know, be ready for you know, emergency situations in general. So the first thing on the list is a tactical folding knife. Uh, these are super handy, not only for defense, but just for everyday tasks like opening boxes and different things like that. Uh, next thing is a cell phone with camera. Most everybody has smartphones nowadays and that's great because sometimes when things happen having a camera is a great um, resource to be able to just take pictures to, of what happened or maybe to call the police you know, and report a crime, whatever the case may be. Next thing is a pen, just being able to write down license plate numbers and stuff like that. Maybe you can't get your phone out fast enough or whatever, but you got a pen handy, you can just jot it down on your hand uh, to be able to report a criminal to the police. Next thing is a small multi-tool. Obviously this is a little tool like a little Leatherman, you know, CS4 juice or something along those lines. It's going to give you lots of options for being able to deal with breakages and accidents and, you know, fixing stuff and things like that. Tactical flashlight. This is another option, uh, you know, for helping you to maintain good situational awareness. If you're walking through dark areas, you can turn that flashlight on and uh, brighten things up, and uh, help you be able to see when you otherwise wouldn't be able to. A way to start a fire. Um, you know, a, having a big lighter, a ferro rod, fre Fresnel lens, Fresnel or Fresnel, depending on how you <laughs> you pronounce it. Um, you know, this is this is just always good to have in case you are ever out and about. You know, a lot of preppers like to spend a lot of time out in the woods, and if you do that, then it's always good to have uh, a way to start a fire. Okay, so the next category is non-lethals. We're talking about pepper sprays, batons, coubatons, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, sometimes a situation doesn't call for you to pull your firearm, and if that's the case, then you may need to have, handle things, you know, from a hand-to-hand -hand perspective. So it's always good to have those non-lethal options. All right, with the concealed carry firearm, uh, I personally recommend having at least a 380 ACP or 9mm single stack or higher. Um, a lot of people carry a Glock 19, which is a double stack uh, 9mm. That's great. I carry a Smith & Wesson Shield, which is a single stack 9mm. And that's a that's an ex outstanding firearm for the price, in my opinion. Okay, you also want to carry an extra loaded magazine with you. Uh, jams do happen, and it's always good to have an extra magazine there if possible, or if you just need more rounds. And the next thing is a tourniquet. Uh, if you're carrying a firearm, you should be carrying a tourniquet. And that's just because there's always a possibility of getting shot. And we have found uh, through many years in uh, you know, the Middle East that having tourniquets is a great way to save lives. You should also look at having a first aid kit or trauma kit if you can't carry it on your person, uh, which you know most people don't, then you should have one in your vehicle or somewhere close by or maybe in an EDC backpack or something along those lines. Uh, there are some ankle kits that are made 
that you can carry uh, you know basic first aid supplies on your ankle all right so that pretty much wraps up the everyday carry gear list um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the nine basic essential needs of modern life now these this category of nine things should basically be used to help you establish what things should go in what different bags and what items do you need to prepare for pretty much any emergency situation so let's go through these here this first one is sustenance that is food and water that's going to be critical uh, you need to have extra food and water so that you can stay home and take care of you know dur through the duration of whatever emergency you may face and if you're packing a bag like a bug out bag or something along those lines then you also need to have food and water in that as well okay the next one is protection from the elements and this one we're talking about clothing and shelter um, you know the clothing is your first line of defense against the elements and having good heavy-duty clothing is highly recommended uh, with shelter we're talking about your home we're also talking about uh, if you were in a mobile situation you know the the type of tent that you use or you know a tarp to keep the rain off your your back something along those lines next one is health in this category we're talking about your emotional physical and spiritual health uh, in this category we're also talking about you know your physical health which is regards to with regards to first aid kits trauma kits and those kinds of things um, yeah that's pretty much it for that one and so for the number four is security uh, having a sense of safety is really important to in order for you to be able to maintain your emotional health and uh, so in this category we want to talk about knowing martial arts having non-lethal options and lethal weapons as well and this this in this section can be expanded out to uh, cover both you know home security home defense as well as uh, camp defense if you had to be in a mobile situation as well okay number five is uh, power and heat generation um, you know this is a section where you're gonna need to be able to build fire if you're out you know out and about or if you don't have any electricity um, and the fire is gonna you know give you uh, the ability to cook food and keep yourself warm uh, if you're in a home a home setting you know this could be uh, for generating electricity with generators or maybe with batteries uh, just depends on the situation and what you have but that is a category that is uh, very important for modern life number six is communication you need to be able to get information from the outside world and have communication with your team members getting information from the outside world is very important and it will help you uh, maintain that peace of mind and give you better situational awareness so you can know what's going on in a disaster number seven is travel being able to move from one destination to another if required uh, many people like to say that they're gonna stay at home no matter what but unfortunately there are a lot of things that could cause you to have to leave having different travel options is a good idea uh, number eight is tools these are the force multipliers that will enable quick and efficient task completion um, different kinds of false force multipliers are uh, everything from you know night vision goggles to uh, generators to you know just any of the different tools that help preppers uh, be a little bit more efficient in whatever task it is that they have at hand all right number nine is admin this is not the most exciting category but it might be one of the more important ones uh, this is talking about your finances are you in debt you know do you have a lot of credit card debt another unsecured debt um, your will what happens if you die do you know will your stuff be passed along appropriately to the folks that you want it to do you have life insurance Do you have an emergency binder with your important documents so those kinds of things those are all important aspects again you can apply each one of these uh, different categories to pretty much all aspects of prepping okay so the next one is redundancy and planning so this concept uh, is basically built around Murphy's law and that is anything that can go wrong anything that can go wrong will go wrong so we try to do what we can to fight against this with redundancy and planning um, 
the U.S. military estimates that they will see a one-third failure rate within their equipment and plans. And if you plan ahead, if you plan for this ahead of time using the PACE acronym, um, or using that PACE mindset, then those failures are not going to be critical. Now, PACE stands for Primary, Alternate, Contingency, and Emergency. Many times in the, in the prepping community, you'll hear people say, you know, uh, two is one and one is none. And that is because of the idea of redundancy that we're talking about here. But you also need to be thinking about redundancy in your plans as well. So having a primary, an alternate, a contingency, and an emergency plan uh, is highly recommended, especially for those critical things, you know, like uh, getting from your home to your bug out location, um, back and forth to work, knowing alternate routes, you know, those kinds of things. Okay, so your area of responsibility or your AOR. This is this is something that uh, probably not en not enough people focus on, um, and and they probably should a little bit more. The most people live their live their lives, you know, going from home to work, get the kids to school, maybe go to church, uh, maybe have some local family and some hobbies and entertainment. So if you can imagine that on a map or actually pull out a map and physically draw all those locations of where you go on a regular basis throughout your life and put a circle around them. That is your AOR. That's your area of responsibility. This is the area that you need to study to determine what you need to plan for. We, what you need to do is take a look at that circle and you know look historically and see what disasters have uh, occurred within that area what disasters are probable. You know, take a look at the uh, what is what is contained within that circle. Are there chemical plants? Are there military bases? Are there, you know, high targets for terrorism? You know, those kinds of things. You need to look at it and see what could go wrong here. And just use some imagination and then start start planning for those things. Uh, you want to use pace to determine your routes to and from each location that you often frequent. Uh, or that you know you may need to go back and forth to. Um, you want to identify bad parts of town and high crime areas. You want to you know highlight the areas that you should probably stay away from. Take a look at what are the high and low population density areas. You know um, if if it's an emergency situation, you might need to be able to get from one per, one place to another, and you'd like to be able to do that going through the low population density areas so that you don't have as many people to deal with. Uh, so when you're planning your routes, you know, make sure to take that into consideration. What are some of the resources uh, located within your AOR that can be helpful to you? You know, what are where are ATM locations where you can pull money out if you need to? Where are um, you know grocery stores and hardware stores and different things of those natures? You know, have those things. Know where all, know where all those things are. You don't want to just be present in your AOR. You want to actually study it, know it well, and be the master of your domain. Okay, team plans. So being a team member or being a member of a team is crucial. Doing it alone is not a realistic option. Let me say that one more time. Doing it alone is not a realistic option. Um, it doesn't have to be a formal and organized team. You don't have to have a you know a formal prepper group or mutual assistance group, you know, or anything like that. Although those those things do afford you many advantages, and and it's great if you can find one. But a lot of people are in situations where they just can't find one. Um, even as uh, even if you just have a, a casual association of people who agree to help each other out in an emergency, this is a lot better than no team at all. I think when you're building a team, you should be looking for people who you already trust in your normal life. Look for friends, family members, coworkers, church members, hobby associates, etc. Those kinds of people that you know you already know and have an idea of what their personality is like. Spend time with uh, talking with these potential members, and you know to make plans where where you guys would go if there was an emergency. Um, will they show up at your house, or would you show up at theirs? Will everybody meet at a different location and bug out together in certain circumstances? 
you know, go through a lot of what-if scenarios together to get an idea of where everyone is at mentally on these various different types of situations. And as much as possible, look for opportunities to train together before a situation goes bad. This is really important. Uh, training is a great way to make the team bond, and it's also a great way to ensure that each member knows how to do you know, different areas of uh, preparedness in case one member gets hurt. So you could cross train on first aid, you know, you can cross train on tactics, you can do, um, you know, training and gardening and canning and, you know, all different kinds of things that would be helpful in an emergency situation. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, bugging in just briefly your primary shelter in place location. For most people, this is your home. You know, your home is where your castle, or your home is your castle, and that's where you probably plan to make your stand until it isn't, you know, until something happens that causes you to have to move. Um, we, we do want to make our primary option being uh, the bug in option, but sometimes things happen. Okay, so with your home, you should be looking at potentially making some security upgrades. You want to use the four D's of home security, and that's detour, detect, delay, and defend. Um, consider, you know, putting uh, door armor on, using ballistic window film, maybe adding a security system, motion lights, thorny shrubs on your perimeter, maybe getting a perimeter fence, you know, those kinds of things. And although it's ideal to be able to stay in your home if possible, um, like I said, we have to realize that there's many situations that could force you to have to leave. So we also have to be prepared for that possibility. Make sure you have a bug out bag ready to go for each member of your home. Now this bug out bag should cover the basics and weigh no more than 20% of your body weight of whoever's going to carry it. Okay, so as far as a home defense plan goes, um, you know, these are going to be uh, highly unique to your situation. Uh, but when a lot of people hear home defense, they immediately think of, you know, dogs and a, and a pump shotgun. <laughs> and those are great. Those are, those are great ways to uh, start out. Um, my recommendations for firearms, uh, there's basically three that can work out depending on your scenario and, and how you want to go about it. Personally, I think that a high-capacity full-size 9mm uh, with hollow point ammo and a flashlight and laser on it um, can be a very good option for most people. And I say this because uh, answering the door if something goes bump in the night with, um, you know, maybe somebody's banging on your door or ringing your doorbell or something, it's good to have the option to be able to just tuck that, uh, you know, back behind uh, your robe or in your belt or whatever the case may be so that that gun is a little bit more concealable. Um, having, if you only have a 12 gauge pump shotgun or a semi-automatic, then you don't really have many options for concealing it. And so uh, it's for that reason that I put shotgun in the number two position there. If you're going to use a shotgun, I'd use a number four buckshot. Um, but, you know, you can also use an AR-15 uh, or an AR-15 pistol. I like the AR-15 pistols because the barrel is a little bit shorter and you're going to get a little bit slower on the velocity. Uh, so if you combine that with hollow points and expandable tip ammo, then you're probably not going to have uh, terrible overpenetration issues. Um, whichever firearm you choose is fine. You just do what's best for you, but make sure that it does have at least a light on it, if not a light and laser combo. Um, the next thing you need to be thinking about is, is the firearm safe located in your bedroom for quick access? Because it should be. You should be able to get to it fairly quickly without having to leave your bedroom. You might also consider having body armor, um, at least just soft armor. Uh, level 3A armor is fine, or level 2 armor. Um, you know, in your closets or somewhere available where you or your spouse could throw it on if need be. If you're going to grab a gun and go confront some kind of a threat, you might also want to throw on a piece of body armor. It's going to help your uh, survivability go up considerably. Okay, so the next thing is make a plan to determine who will do what if someone comes in. Uh, will one parent go get the kids? One parent deal with the threat? Or if you have older kids, maybe the older kid can take the kid, the other kids 
uh, into a back room while one spouse covers the back door and the other one covers the front door. You know, you just basically just need to make a plan that makes sense for your home. Okay, so you also want to spend time identifying the safe shooting lanes within your home. Know um, where you can shoot and where you can't because of where beds are laid out and different things like that. In the bedrooms, you need to have a good idea of, you know, where are going to be the good places for you to engage a threat with, to where you don't have to worry about over penetration and those rounds going through and hitting another family member. You should also identify locations that provide real cover within your home, not just concealment. And drywall walls are concealment, not cover. So think about that as well. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about bug out vehicle. For most people, this will be their everyday vehicle. If that's the case, make sure you have a get home bag, a trauma kit, and emergency gear in your daily driver. You also wanna keep your, your fuel tank half full at least. Um, if you can, go ahead and keep an, a weapon and extra ammo in the vehicle if it's legal to do so in your state. Obviously, you want to use discretion here. If you live in the inner city where there's a lot of car break-ins and stuff like that, this may not make sense, so use common sense. Next thing is, is a folding bicycle. This is a great option to speed up your trip home if the roads are blocked and you can't drive. Uh, being able to pull that bicycle out, hop on it, and just ride home quickly is uh, probably going to reduce your your time in an emergency considerably. I recommend having subdued colored four-wheel drive SUV or truck. I think these are ideal because you can haul more gear in them should you need to bug out. And speaking of bugging out, it's always a good idea to have a small trailer as well. Either a small utility trailer or even better is an enclosed box trailer that you could fill up with all of your uh, preparedness gear, your food, water, self-defense items, those kind of things, and take them with you. RVs are also a great option. Uh, RVs uh, enable you to go ahead and pre-stock those things, you know, in the trailer or in the uh, in the motorhome, and you could fire that up and just be ready to move. Uh, ATVs, UTVs, dirt bikes, these all make great alternate forms of transportation. Um, you know, if you have a small utility trailer and a four-wheeler uh, on, on the back, then, you know, if something happens and the truck breaks down or the truck can't get through, then you can always unload the ATV, uh, pack it full of, you know, as much stuff as it can carry, and then head across, you know, wherever you need to uh, on the ATV. Same thing goes with electric bikes, uh, regular bicycle, maybe even a bike with a small trailer. Again, using this is using the PACE uh, acronym to have multiple different ways to be able to bug out if necessary. And then you could look at even just you know having a game cart, jogging stroller, or even a two wheel two wheel dolly, so that you can carry um, you know more stuff a little bit easier for longer distances. Again, bugging out is not the primary option; it is a secondary option, but sometimes it just happens. Okay, so the secondary shelter-in-place location or your bug-out location, or BOL. As we've said, uh, multiple situations could force you to leave your home. Uh, you do need to be ready to leave in short notice should this situation arrive. But before you go, you should have a place identified. You know, where are you going to go? And uh, ideally, you would like to be able to go to a location that you owned, although that may not be financially feasible for everyone. That should be a place that has on-site shelter with supplies pre-positioned. That's your bug out location. You want to have this in a place that has low population density. It's resource rich, rural, and secluded. If you don't have your own land uh, to go to, you may be able to utilize a friend or family's home or their land, who, you know, somebody who lives out of the affected area. Um, maybe you can arrange this ahead of time and pre-position supplies at that, at that location. You could also just go ahead and keep a list of hotel phone numbers uh, that are a couple of hours away from you that, that could be used in, a, in the case of a natural disaster or a regional event. Not all events are going to be big SHTF nationwide things. In fact, most of them probably won't be. So just having a, a hotel to go to might be a good option for you. 
All right, so as a last resort, if none of the above is possible, um, you should go ahead and scout out several locations on public land or national forest or on BLM land ahead of time. That would you know, be good places for you to camp out, uh, places with plenty of resources in the area. I would avoid private property unless you have permission, or maybe you could even get a lease, you know, like a deer hunting lease or those kinds of things. Um, if public land is not suitable, you could also consider commercially owned land, you know, but realize that this is trespassing, so it should only be done as a last resort. Okay, guys, so this has been some very broad, basic concepts that apply to disaster preparedness. Um, we haven't gotten too deep into this stuff. We're just scratching the surface, but like I said, we'll be doing more of this in depth on Patreon. So today we talked about mindset. We talked about situational awareness, some everyday carry gear, nine essentials of any disaster situation, redundancy and planning, your AOR or area of responsibility. We talked about team plans, primary shelter in place locations or bugging in. We talked about a home defense plan, bug out vehicles, and secondary shelter in place locations or bugging out. With that, if you guys have any questions, you can email me at AmericanPreppingAcademy at ProtonMail.com. Thanks for watching.